Welcome to MTN Outdoors. Hey there, and welcome to this week's MTN Outdoors. I'm John Riley, filling in for Andy Curtis. Andy's been convinced to go on a two-week backcountry jackalope spotting trip. And honestly, we just didn't have the heart to tell him the truth about jackalopes, which are totally real. On this week's show, we take a look at ways Montana is investigating dangerous chemicals being found in freshwater fish populations across the United States. Proposed federal legislation that would prevent foreign entities from owning critical Montana land and meet with a nonprofit who is dedicated to caring for abused, neglected, and abandoned horses. But first, federal leaders say there's enough evidence to start a review of whether to keep grizzlies on the list of endangered and threatened wildlife. Jonathan Ambarian has more on what that means for Montana and how the state is preparing. Montana leaders have been petitioning the federal government to consider delisting the grizzly bear and giving the state the opportunity to manage the species. Now, federal leaders say there's enough evidence for them to start a 12-month review on whether to keep the bear on the list of endangered and threatened wildlife. Lawmakers here at the state capitol are considering bills that would set the state's direction if delisting goes forward. Republican Senator Butch Gillespie is a rancher from Etheridge in north central Montana. He says landowners in his area have had run-ins with grizzlies, and he believes this is the right time to consider delisting. The bear population is doing well. Now we just have to try to get a little more safety, a little more control, get it back to Montana management, because somebody in New York, Washington, D.C., cannot even have an inkling of what happens here on the home front. Democratic Senator Pat Flowers, the Senate Minority Leader, is a former regional supervisor with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, and was involved with previous discussions on delisting in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. He says the federal action is appropriate. We've met those criteria for recovery, and when you meet those criteria, we should then take the next step towards uh, proposed delisting, and I think that's the next step that the service is taking now. Last week, the Montana Senate passed a bill that would make it the policy of the state to manage grizzly populations to maintain delisted status. Gillespie says he plans to bring another bill that would ask the state to create rules after delisting, allowing landowners to kill a grizzly that is attacking or killing livestock, but requiring them to consult with FWP on how to respond if a bear is simply threatening livestock. We're trying to give uh, some assurance uh, to the people back in D.C. pulling the strings that yes, we do know how to take care of them, we do know how to manage them. Flowers said not all Democrats are convinced it was the right time to move forward with delisting, but he believes Gillespie's proposal is a step toward adequate regulatory language. The ranchers on the front, conservationists, sportsmen, all recognize the need for and the value of a he healthy bear population, and I think uh, that's one of the values, in my mind, of having it delisted and a state-managed species. Gillespie's bill is not yet officially introduced, but he expects to submit it by early next week. In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. Some have been concerned about the Chinese government's presence in Montana even before the big balloon over Billings this week. That includes fears that Chinese companies could be purchasing land and threatening our food security. And that has prompted some proposed legislation at the state capitol. As of the end of 2021, China companies own more than 384,000 acres of agricultural land in the United States. I'm less than a half a mile away from uh, a missile site, and actually my brother owns the ground around the missile site. There's no way we'd ever sell to somebody like that. Eric Sommerfeld grows wheat and barley in power just north of Great Falls and is a Montana Farmers Union board member. He's a big supporter of Montana Senate Bill 203 introduced last week. Its goal? Prohibiting foreign adversaries from buying, leasing, or renting critical infrastructure in Montana, including land used for agriculture. Letting a foreign adversary have control over our food supply is very dangerous. The legislation was drafted after a land purchase in North Dakota when a Chinese food manufacturer bought 300 acres of land near Grand Forks Air Force Base. But the bill's backers say there have also been other examples. In 2013, a Chinese company purchased Smithfield Foods, the largest pork producer in the world. 
And in here in Montana, we have seen more land being purchased by foreign companies, up from 843,000 acres in 2020 to more than 916,000 acres in 2021. There is pause for concern for many of our members. Ray Lee Honeycutt is with the Montana Stock Growers Association, one of several agriculture groups that support the bill. She's worried about food security. If you care about the security of our country, if you care about food security, um, definitely it's something that everyone should be paying attention to. We have the U.S. Department of Commerce telling us there are adversarial nations and to be aware and that we need to do our part to protect our borders. And this is how we can do it. Miles City State Senator Ken Bogner is the main sponsor of the legislation. Federal law does not restrict the amount of private agricultural land that can be foreign owned and no state has an absolute prohibition, but legislatures in Montana and Wyoming are each considering bills to change that. It's making sure the people here in Montana and the U.S. have the highest quality, the safest food, and at a reasonable price. As for this bill, it's legislation that was in the works long before the Chinese balloon was spotted, but one that may now have even more support because of it. In Billings, David J. MTN News. This horse virus is affecting local businesses like the Majestic Valley Arena. They told me that this is adversely affecting their business and they are losing money from canceling events, but they are willing to do whatever it takes to keep horses safe and healthy. I also spoke to a local equine vet about the virus and what this could mean for the future. You know, the, the, the hard thing is, is when anybody loses a horse, it's really devastating to the family, uh, especially when there's kids involved. It's unclear how the virus variation reached the flathead, but it's already impacting horses. While vets don't expect any long-term effects from this EHM outbreak, action must be taken to mitigate the spread. To mitigate uh, the, the spread of it is just to try to not to commingle as much, which is hard for the horse community because they love commingling, so it's tough. But I think is I think we just need to kind of let things kind of quiet down, and and. It will in a matter of time, um, two to three weeks is the incubation periods of the virus. So once we have no new cases, then we can start ramping up our, our events again. In Kalispell, Kiana Wilson, MTN News. Next on MTN Outdoors, we take a look at Montana's waterways and how DQ and FWP are looking closer at forever chemicals. But first, some trivia. Did you know there's at least 90 different species of fish that live in Montana's waterways? Of all those species, how many are considered threatened or endangered? Is it three, seven, or 11? We'll have the answer coming up after the break. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Welcome back, everyone. So do you think you know how many threatened or endangered fish species call Montana home? While there are a number of species that have their own local protections, such as the cutthroat trout and arctic grayling, only three, the white and pallid sturgeon and bull trout, are considered threatened or endangered. Now it's no secret that I'm a big fisherman, although I tend to release most trout that I land. See, as a kid, my grandpa would serve it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and it wasn't always fully cooked. However, there is a new reason we should pay closer attention to freshwater fish that we eat. With FWP and DQ looking into the prevalence of forever chemicals in Montana's waterways this summer, MTN's Tom Buchanan reports. A recent study found that freshwater fish throughout the United States contain significant PFAS or forever chemicals. I mean, Montana is known as the last best place, and I think that's especially true when it comes to our fishing resources. Um, but you know, we're not immune to contamination or contaminants. Um, these were used here just like they were used all across the country. PFAS was. The study conducted by the Environmental Working Group found that median levels of PFAS in freshwater fish were 278 times higher than the PFAS levels in commercial fish tested. PFAS or per and polyfluoralkyl substances are used in hundreds of industrial and consumer products such as food packaging and waterproof or stain resistant fabrics. These chemicals can leach into water, food, and even onto dust that can be inhaled. The study says that mitigating sources of PFAS exposure is an urgent public health priority. So they've been linked to effects on the liver as well as the central immune system. And there's, they're also a known carcinogen. So there's a number of you know, deleterious health effects um, from these contaminants. 
Trevor Selch, pollution control biologist at Montana FWP, says that this study has spurred him and the DEQ to test fish samples throughout Montana this upcoming summer. Then, using EPA guidelines, they will be able to deliver fish consumption guidelines in order to dictate safe levels of consumption in regards to PFAS. Ultimately, we'll take the concentrations we find and, and transfer those into NEAL guidance. And so it's hard to know, um, based on what EPA comes out with, with their criteria, what that's going to lead to. Reporting in Helena, Tom Buchanan, MTN News. Despite moderate conditions, experts warn of avalanche danger in the backcountry across northwest Montana. Two skiers were thankfully unharmed after being caught and carried roughly 150 feet in an avalanche on Sunday in the Flathead Mountain Range. Flathead Avalanche Center forecaster Cameron Johnson says they are starting to see an uptick in reports of human-triggered avalanches. A lot of these uh, reported avalanches are in wind-drifted snow, um, so areas where the wind has transported snow into thicker, um, thicker slabs uh, that can be yeah, possible to trigger for a human. Despite a slightly lower than average snowpack in northwest Montana for this time of year, Johnson says consistent winds on mountain slopes are creating wind slabs, which can easily break, causing avalanches. We've had consistent days of some of our remote weather stations reporting averages of 25 miles an hour, um, and a lot of them reporting from 10 to 20 miles an hour. So really good speeds for forming wind slabs, and it doesn't matter, you know, a lot of times whether snow fell that day, if there's loose snow um, sitting on the surface and the winds pick up, it's a recipe for wind slabs. Johnson says the group of skiers caught in Sunday's avalanche reported the information to the Avalanche Center's observations page. He says that information is valuable because it allows professional forecasters to further analyze the avalanche area and warn others of potential danger. The best way to learn about avalanches is by looking at them. Um, and so we can gl glean a lot of information from uh, from these events. Johnson advises backcountry enthusiasts to check their website daily for an updated avalanche forecast and to always be prepared for the worst to happen. Have the tools, uh, shovel, beacon, probe, and know how to use those. And have a partner in case uh, unforeseen happens and, uh, and you do need a rescue. Two is a lot better than one in, those, in, in that instance. In Hungry Horse, Sean Wells, MT News. The snowpack changes daily, and it's super important to check out your local avalanche forecast before you recreate in the backcountry. I'm on Marshall Mountain today with Arden from West Central Montana Avalanche Center, and he's going to give you a few pieces of information to know before you head outside. Montana is home to some of the most beautiful backcountry in the United States, but venturing into these areas, especially in the winter, should be done with caution. There's three critical pieces of backcountry gear that you need to bring with you every time you go in the backcountry. First one I have in here is a beacon. It's a small device that helps you locate people who are buried in avalanches. Critical. You have to wear it on your body. Make sure it's not in your backpack or on your snowmobile or anything like that. On your person. When you get to the trailhead, you want to do a beacon check and make sure everyone's gear is functioning properly. One of the other three pieces of gear is shovel. You want to have a good metal shovel that fits in your backpack, easy to carry around, and can dig effectively. The last of the three pieces is a probe, a long probe that's gonna help you find people who are buried in the debris. I'm gonna throw it out. In the end, this is emergency rescue equipment. The goal is that you never have to use this stuff. Mm -hmm. You wanna do everything in your power to avoid an emergency situation using this equipment, but you still have to bring it every time in case something does go wrong. The West Central Montana Avalanche Center recommends you keep aware and look out for red flags. Recent avalanche activity, uh, signs of instability like cracking or collapsing, heavy snowfall or heavy rain, uh, rapid melting, and uh, wind, wind drifted snow as well. It's very important to know before you go. Check your local avalanche forecast and make sure you're smart in the backcountry. In Missoula, on Marshall Mountain, Emily Brown, MTN News. Stick around, everyone, because after the break, we see how a nonprofit is caring for abused and neglected horses, and Tanner Saul breaks down why animals have been getting smaller. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Welcome back, everyone. After the brutally cold weather we've had in recent months, it's nice being able to get back out here and get some exercise. 
And in my case, yeah, lose some of this winter weight. I'm not the only one getting smaller though. Turns out many animals are too. Tanner Saul explains why animals have been shrinking in recent decades and how it relates to changing climate conditions. The mighty polar bear is now two thirds of their size from just 30 years ago. And menhaden, which is a silverfish that's widely used for animal feed and bait, has shrunk on average by 15% over the last 65 years. But it's not just them. Scientists have observed that birds, amphibians, and mammals all are becoming smaller. The reason for this shrinkage is climate change. As the climate changes, many animals are finding it harder to regulate their body temperature. And in order to survive, they are shrinking in size impacting ecosystems and our day-to-day -day lives. In 1847, zoologist Christian Bergman made a groundbreaking observation. He noticed that closely related species of mammals and birds that lived in warmer climates tended to be smaller in size. This, he reasoned, was because smaller animals have a higher surface area to volume ratio, meaning they lose heat faster and struggle to maintain their body temperature in cold conditions. This is now known as Bergman's principle. Body size affects everything from the ability to catch food to the chances of escaping from predators to finding a mate. Wildlife are already facing a wide range of threats like urbanization and fragmentation of landscapes, pushing certain species even closer to extinction. So as animals get smaller in size, it will have a ripple effect throughout the ecosystem. We've actually seen this in the fossil record. 56 million years ago, rapid global warming events were occurring. These events are similar to the greenhouse warming that we are currently experiencing. One of these changes that occurred during these events was the phenomenon of animals shrinking. These warming events accompanied with animals getting smaller caused massive extinction events from the land to the ocean and actually was the largest deep sea mass extinction event in the last 93 million years. The temperature change that caused this extinction was a mere nine degrees Fahrenheit over a 20,000 year time period. According to NOAA, in just the past 100 years, our temperatures have changed by 2 degrees Fahrenheit. It's at a much more rapid pace than 56 million years ago, which means wildlife barely have time to evolve to the changes. Scientists are also finding that animals can only shrink so much until it becomes disadvantageous. A recent model of water requirements for smaller body desert birds provided evidence that their small body size makes them more susceptible to dehydration on hot days. Meaning their size may help with cooling, but it causes trade-offs that could be deadly. Discovering animals are shrinking sheds light on the far-reaching impacts of climate change and can help gain insight into their tolerances and better predict wildlife's responses to future changes. In Missoula, Tanner Saw, MTN News. This is Cimarron, and he's one of the horses that the River Pines Horse Sanctuary has taken in that has had a really rough ride lately. The River Pines Horse Sanctuary in Missoula has goals for their horses. The basic idea is to save the horses, rehab them, turn them into ambassadors so they meet and greet people, and then serve the community however we can. Sherry says horses have specific needs in order to thrive. Food and shelter, um, fresh water every day, uh, vet and farrier care, and uh, I just calculated it out that the cost of having a horse here that can just for maintenance and thriving is um, about $2,500 a year per horse. Most special of their needs is the need for friendship and a place to roam and play. They all live in a, a herd-based setting. They all have companionship. They all have a, as much space as I can give them. There's a whole variety of horses here, from Icelandic to miniature. We have 23 in the... These aren't your average beehive boxes. They're actually hand-painted by a local Billings man. He crafts them in the winter to be able to sell the colorful Montana-made boxes in the spring. It's a lot of work, but a lot of fun. When you imagine your golden years, this may not be what comes to mind. But for Tony Seitz, this liquid gold is a hobby that has him buzzing. When you get old, it's nice to have a good, fun hobby that everybody else could enjoy too. Seitz got into the beekeeping business just five years ago and decided to add his own creative spin. He began creating these unique hand-painted bee boxes to sell as a hobby. This Dr. Sharshkin from Missouri was giving a seminar in Bozeman and I thought, oh, I don't want to go all the way to Bozeman, two full days. But I did. And I, after 15 minutes, it was the most interesting thing ever. And although he knows quite a bit about bees. In here, 
they'll have the queen bee will be inside. He says he still has a lot to learn. You never know enough about bees. I probably know 10% at the most of what there is to know about bees. It's complex and it's interesting. At the same time, it's a little simple. Put the bees in and collect the honey. Sites orders the frames for his bee boxes online and assembles them before painting the outside. And this year, he's trying something new. You can open this when the hive is full and you'll see all the bees working along here. A plexiglass window so you can watch the bees working without disturbing them. And these boxes are built to sustain Montana's cold winters. It's got an inch and a half of styrofoam and all the sides in the bottom and two inches on the top because the top has to be more insulated. So it's fit for Montana weather. It's fit for Montana weather pretty much. Fit for the weather and a lot of fun to make. It's fun to make them different than just a box. In Billings, Kelsey Marison, MTN News. Well, that's going to just about wrap things up for us here on this week's episode of Empty and Outdoors. As always, here's the brag board. But since I don't have access to Andy's email, here's just some pictures of Andy. That's right, Andy Curtis, who is currently in the middle of nowhere searching for jackalopes, which are totally real. If you have any good ways to lure jackalopes, or snipes for that matter, please send those instructions to andy.curtis at ktbh.com. Calving is well underway in the state, which means it's officially the start of baby season in Montana. So congratulations to all the new outdoors parents. I'm John Riley. Have a good one, and I'll catch you next time. MTN, Montana's news leader.